Life imitating fiction. As if in a scene from one of his action movies, actor Harrison Ford crash lands a small plane on a golf course. Wincing and tears. Reactions from jurors and spectators to graphic testimony in the Boston Marathon bombing trial. Faithful servant. We remember the priesthood and leadership of Cardinal Edward Egan. Cristo è risorto. Cristo vive. And Pope Francis meets with a lay movement, encouraging their missionary spirit. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Friday, March 6th, 2015. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your News Now. Emotional testimony this week in a high-profile trial leaves some jurors wincing and people in the gallery in tears. The Boston Marathon bombing April 15, 2013, left three dead and more than 250 people injured. The admitted bomber now faces a possible death penalty. New photos released at the Zonayev trial reveal the unsuspecting crowd outside the Forum restaurant before police say Johar Zonayev places the second bomb. And then, moments later, complete carnage. Smells of sulfur and burning hair, witnesses say, filled the air. This same spot is where Bill Richards' family was all together for the last time. His six-year-old daughter, Jane, loses her leg in the explosion. His eight-year-old son, Martin, lost his life. On the stand this week, Richards said it was difficult talking about his son, recalling, I saw a little boy who had his body severely damaged. Richard also testified he lost some hearing due to the blast, but says, quote, I could still hear the beautiful voices of my family. Football coach Alan Hearn described how he found his badly injured 11-year-old son outside the forum. He said, it really hurts, Dad. It really hurt. On his outer left thigh, there was a crater about as big as my hand. It was mangled flesh full of blood. 29-year-old Crystal Campbell couldn't be saved. Officer Frank Chiola fought for her life. As I applied chest compressions, he said, smoke was coming out of her mouth. This is Jeff Bauman, whose rescue was captured in the iconic photo. He recalled seeing Zarnayev moments before the explosion. Everyone else was clapping, he said. I looked at him and he stared down at me and I just thought it was odd. Some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. Not long after becoming New York's Archbishop, the tragedy of 9-11 hit his flock hard. Tonight, Jason Calvey remembers Cardinal Edward Egan, who died yesterday at age 82. Brian, the Cardinal died of a heart attack yesterday. It comes after a long life of service. A native of the Chicago area, Egan held a doctorate in canon law and worked at the Vatican, but he's best known as a shepherd of America's largest city. St. John Paul II appointed Edward Egan to the Archdiocese of New York in 2000. I come only to serve you. A year later, he graced the annual St. Patrick's Day parade as Cardinal. Hi. Hi. Congratulations, how Cardinal. How are you doing? I'm so happy. Congratulations. Congratulations. You ladies all wish you had this outfit. <laughs> I'm going to lend it to her next week. <laughs> that year, the unexpected happened on 9 11. Cardinal Egan would comfort a city and a world in grief. We lost women and men and children whom we sorely needed, whom we greatly admired, whom we dearly cherish. Egan was at the conclave to elect Pope Benedict and at the Pope's side during a visit to Ground Zero. While a seminarian in Rome, Washington Cardinal Donald Worrell became friends with the then Father Egan. He was a great help to all of us. He would, uh, he would work with us on papers we had to do. I always found him delightful. Uh, he, would, uh, he would say things like, I don't think you really want to say that, do you? <laughs> Cardinal Egan led the New York church for nearly a decade. He retired there in 2009. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Pope Francis sent his condolences, saying he's thankful for Cardinal Egan's years of ministry, including helping with the revision of church law after Vatican II. Brian? All right, thank you, Jason. 
And from the south to the northeast, this winter is not over yet. Temperatures across much of the U.S. range from 10 to 30 degrees below average. Heavy snow covers the mid-Atlantic. Thousands of motorists were stranded for up to 24 hours on a Kentucky interstate this week in a 26-mile long backup. With warming temperatures, there are no new concerns about flash flooding as more than a foot of snow melts. Now both runways are open again at New York's LaGuardia Airport. A jet that skidded off the runway and smashed through a fence yesterday has been removed. Veteran actor Harrison Ford, who crash-landed his small plane Thursday, is expected to make a full recovery. The star of Indiana Jones and Star Wars films was piloting his vintage World War II era plane. It lost engine power shortly after takeoff and crash-landed in a golf course near Los Angeles. Experts call this crash-landing beautifully executed by an unbelievably well-trained pilot. Ford suffered a cut to his forehead, scraped arms, possible internal injuries as well, but they are not life-threatening. Pope Francis met with the president of Azerbaijan and his wife today. They discussed Catholic community life in the nation that sits at the crossroads of Eastern Europe and Western Asia. Pope Francis and the president focused on the value of interreligious dialogue to promote peace. Azerbaijan is more than 93 percent Muslim. The battle over keeping Catholic schools Catholics, or Catholic rather, continues in San Francisco. The Archdiocese of San Francisco updated its high school faculty handbook last month. New clauses require staff members to uphold church teaching, denouncing issues the church teaches are gravely evil. California lawmakers urged San Francisco Archbishop Salvatore Cordelion to remove the morality clause. Cordelion responded by asking, would you hire a campaign manager who advocates policies contrary to those you stand for? Patrick Deneen is an associate professor of constitutional studies at the University of Notre Dame. And Leslie Ford is with the DeVos Center for Religion and Civil Society at the Heritage Foundation. You wrote an editorial for the Wall Street Journal on this. What is your main concern? My main concern here is really the lawmakers who are questioning the Archdiocese's actions here. Two of the lawmakers have even asked if investigations can be opened into the Archdiocese's actions. Now this is concerning because as lawmakers they should understand that the Archdiocese has the right, the freedom, to ensure that the Catholic schools are Catholic. Patrick, is it legal for the government to try to tell Catholic schools what they can and cannot teach? Well, I mean, I think at this point the, the question or issue is not the legality of what the, of what the, our, of what the diocese is doing, but though it may come to that. It seems to me the question of, of legality always has to be asked in light of the protections of religion and religious organizations that are inscribed in the very First Amendment of our Constitution that protect the free exercise of religion. The bar should be very high before the state interferes in the inner operations of religious organizations. I loved Archbishop Cordelion's response to the lawmaker saying, you wouldn't hire somebody that doesn't agree with your policies. All I ask is for the same. And it's really hard to argue with that, even from a politician. Leslie, companies can fire someone for not adhering to company policy. Isn't this the same thing? It's exactly the same thing, but it's even more important for institutions that are affiliated with the Catholic Church, with any religion. We, would, we understand that schools have the right to expect teachers to uphold the mission, their mission. We would expect this of a Jewish school, of an Islamic school, of even a secular school. Why shouldn't this Catholic school have the same freedom here? And Patrick, do you see this affecting the church, its schools, its institutions as a whole, this debate and what happens with this? There's no question that, that what hangs in the balance here is in many, in many respects the very capacity of the church and its institutions to practice and exercise the freedom of its faith in the public square and in its own institutions. This is a very clarifying moment for us, it seems to me. And it seems to me that we are leaving very quickly the stage in which one can attempt to be half one thing and half the other. The church and its institutions have to be able to control and, and, and operate in a realm of, of freedom in terms of how, how they hire, the kinds of, the kinds of people uh, that they place in positions of ministry, including teachers. And if the church can't do that, then we are no longer living in a free country. What do you think is the next step in California? Well, no one knows what the California legislators are going to do, and no one knows if these investigations are actually going to go forward. But it's important for all of these people involved, the teachers, the families, the lawmakers, to 
uphold religious freedom in this instance. To look at the Catholic Archdiocese and say, we understand that you've been teaching these moral teachings for 2,000 years. This isn't anything new. It's reasonable for you to expect your teachers to come alongside your mission and uphold it. They shouldn't say one thing in the classroom and another thing elsewhere in their life. Archbishop also made it clear this was not to set up people to be fired. It was to clarify what has always been believed and taught by the church. Leslie Ford with the Heritage Foundation, Patrick Deneen from Notre Dame, thank you both for helping us get a clearer picture of this. Thank Thanks for having us. Well, it's been 50 years now since hundreds of marchers, led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., left Selma, Alabama for Montgomery. The anniversary will be commemorated in Selma tomorrow. In March 1965, the protesters encountered violent opposition. They were beaten with billy clubs and attacked by police dogs. With the support of federal troops, the demonstrators successfully made the four-day walk, 50 miles it took them. Later that year, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act, giving all African Americans the right to vote. Coming up, Pope Francis meets with a group of pilgrims who try to imitate the early Christians. Thank God for Friday, and we thank God for each of you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with the EWTN News Nightly team. Pope Francis meets with members of a Catholic missionary movement today, thanking them for their work and the benefit to the church. The neocatechumenal way, or the way as it's often referred to, draws inspiration from the early Christians. It was founded in Spain in 1964. The aim to evangelize non-Christians and fallen away Christians. Cristo è risorto. Cristo vive. The Pope praised the group's missionary spirit. Tomorrow, Francis meets with members of another lay movement, Communion and Liberation, founded by Father Luigi Giussani. Joining us tonight from Rome is Rose Basinje of Uganda, a nurse working with orphans whose parents have died of AIDS. Rose, HIV AIDS has taken so many lives. What are you able to do for these AIDS orphans? Uh, what we are doing is uh, like uh, what any other projects do, but our main aim is to, to tell each person that is infected that is not defined by the HIV AIDS, that uh, even if he's infected, he has a value the same that is not defined by the situation, by the problem, because many times when we find ourselves in problems and uh, situations like sickness and poverty, many times we think that is everything. We, dis we disintegrate into the situation and become a situation. But we are greater than the situation. We are greater than uh, HIV AIDS. What do you think is the most effective way to combat AIDS in, in a morally acceptable way? To combat AIDS is really to say the human life has a value. We protect it. Because if, even if we bring the, the vaccine without knowing that a human, a human being is a value, we, we waste time. Because today there is HIV AIDS, tomorrow there will be another thing. Can you just give us a, a brief picture of Luigi Giussani and the vision that you are carrying out and others there? My dear, that you are talking about my father, <laughs> because uh, this is the man that uh, uh, turned my, uh, my life upside down. That is uh, a revolution in my life, because that is where I understood who God is. Uh, it's really the, uh, the end of slavery for me. So if I talk about Father Giussani, is somebody who ended the slavery in my life. Father Giussani asked me one question. He told me, you know, Rose, if you are the only human being on the earth, God could have come all the same for only this person that is Rose. So this is where I understood that communion and liberation is uh, that God that came to look for me. Well, obviously it's made a huge difference in your life in your life and the lives of many others. Rose Basinje, we appreciate you joining us and our prayers are with you as you meet with the Holy Father. Thank you. 
and Pope Francis is more popular than ever among Americans. That according to a new survey which shows the Pope's popularity in the U.S. rising. Wyatt Goolsby has details tonight. Brian, we are just a few days away from marking the two-year anniversary since Pope Francis was elected, and according to Pew Research, there has been no dip in his popularity, which has been steadily rising, especially among Catholics here in the U.S. It's no secret Pope Francis receives rock star treatment around the world, but the latest numbers prove just how popular he is in the U.S. 90% of American Catholics now say they have at least a favorable view of Francis. Compare that to the 95% of American Catholics who attend weekly Mass. Seems pretty high, right? Well, it's high enough to be on par with St. John Paul II at the height of his popularity. JP2's popularity peaked after a 1996 visit to the U.S. at 93%, and Pope Benedict hit a high at 83% after his U.S. visit in 2008. Jessica Martinez with Pew Research studies the Pope's popularity. Part of what's happening is that among Americans overall, as they get to know more about the Pope, they're increasingly expressing favorable views of him. So as they learn more, they're liking more about him. But for people of faith, it's not the fame that draws them to Pope Francis. Prayer and the Pope are what drew Colleen Payne back to Mass. She was raised Catholic but fell away. Colleen credits her return to Francis. A true Christian is to love, period. That doesn't mean you accept sin or that doesn't mean, but it is to love. It is not for me to judge you or for anyone. And he understands this. Pope Francis truly, truly, by, in the soul, in the core of his being, understands what it's like to truly love a person, and we are not here to judge. Pope Francis is scheduled to visit three American cities in September. Past popes have received a boost in popularity right after their visits, so we'll have to see if his numbers go up uh, even more. But in the meantime, Brian, the Holy Father clearly continues to inspire a lot of Americans. All right, thank you, Wyatt Goolsby. And tonight we revisit an inspirational story from earlier this week about, about a boy who was trapped in his own body for more than a decade. At age 12, Martin Pistorius contracted a mysterious disease. For 12 years, he couldn't speak and was in a coma-like state much of the time. But he regained consciousness and gradually regained his strength and life with help of an alert caretaker. His story is captured in his book, Ghost Boy. While he still can't speak today, Martin can communicate through a computer. Catherine Zeltner spoke with him by Skype. You'll hear a computer voice, but the words are his. How did you cope? during that time. Escaping my reality was difficult, but I was able to develop some coping strategies to help pass the time and basically to keep my mind busy. If there happened to be a radio on, that helped. But I also began to take note of how things changed over time. Everything from how the seasons changed to things as simple as watching a wet floor dry, watching how the sun moved across the room and how the light changed. Another favorite of mine was, if there happened to be an insect of some or other kind, but even better more than one, then I could pretend they were racing each other. But by far, my most effective coping strategy was to escape into my imagination. I would literally live in my imagination. I'd have conversations with myself and other people all in my head. I'd imagine I was doing all sorts of things. I would live inside my mind, sometimes to such an extent that I became almost oblivious to my surroundings. Martin, what role did faith play in all of this? I don't know how I came to realize God. He was just always there. I don't know how to explain it really, but I always had faith that he was and still is there. I grew up in a Christian home. However, we very rarely attended church. This combined with the path my life has taken meant that I never really learned the formalities of the church. Perhaps it is because of all I have been through, I became very close to God. There were many, many times where, in some sense I felt utterly alone, even if there were people around me. However, I always seem to pause when making that statement because while a part of me experienced the extreme loneliness and isolation, another part of me always felt the presence of the Lord. Through everything I went through, I prayed for help, strength, and forgiveness. I gave thanks for the blessings I had and especially for the prayers answered. Even if they were as small as someone moving my body into a different position that alleviated the pain. It is amazing what you can be grateful for. Simple things that a lot of people may not even think about like to sit or lay comfortably for a while. 
For me, God is always there, a constant companion. And yes, I believe had it not been through God's hand, I would not be where I am today. If I stop and think about everything that had to happen, and the odds of that happening then, there is no doubt in my mind that that could only have happened through divine intervention. So when people hear of your story, what do you hope they take away from it? Through everything, I've learned that everyone has a story, their own struggles, challenges and insecurities. I would tell people that there is always hope, no matter how small, to treat everyone with kindness, dignity, compassion and respect whether you think they understand or not. To never underestimate the power of the mind, the importance of love and faith, and to never stop dreaming. Martin Pistorius, thank you so much for joining us today. Your story is an inspiration. Thank you. Up next, a unique look at the late Leonard Nimoy who played and helped create the complex Star Trek character Spock. Thank you so much for joining us on this Friday evening, March 6th. I'm Brian Patrick. Stephen Gradonis of DecentFilms.com, the film critic for the National Catholic Register, joining us by Skype from Bloomfield, New Jersey. Stephen, you wrote a tribute to Leonard Nimoy in the Catholic Register. His death seems almost personal for you. What made him so special to you and so many of his fans? Well, you can see that I am a Star Trek fan. I am wearing my Starfleet shirt. It's a Next Generation, not original series, but Mr. Spock did appear more than once on Next Generation. You know, for a show that only lasted three years and uh, was not a big hit at the time, Star Trek has had a huge impact on popular culture, and Mr. Spock was a very big part of that. He was one of the big three characters along with Kirk and McCoy, but Kirk and McCoy were heroes of types we had seen before. The alpha male hero, the cantankerous doctor. Mr. Spock was something new. He was cerebral. He was dignified, and he was alien. He was different. For a show that was about different possibilities of what the future could be like, Mr. Spock opened the door to whole new worlds of possibilities. How do you think his Jewish heritage found its way into Mr. Spock? Leonard Nimoy drew on his Jewish heritage in a number of different ways. For one thing, being Jewish in a dominant Christian society gave him an experience of difference from the majority culture, of being in some way alien from the people around him, but also maintaining his dignity. And he definitely drew on that in his characterization of Mr. Spock. He also drew on his heritage in other specific ways. One way that's been much talked about in the last week is in the famous Vulcan salute which he adapted from a Jewish priestly blessing that he had seen as a boy in synagogue. The priest holds up his hand in the shape of the Hebrew letter Shin, and this is used in a Jewish priestly blessing. Uh, he always got a big kick out of the fact that Star Trek fans were going around blessing each other with this, this Jewish blessing. How interesting. It's also interesting to point out that the creator of Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry, was a committed secular humanist. Does that create concerns for Catholics when it comes to watching this product? I think it's of some concern insofar as Roddenberry's vision was secular. He did think that religion was something that mankind was going to outgrow eventually, along with racism and poverty, but not insofar as the show is humanist. I think that we as Catholics for too long have allowed secularists to claim the term humanist as their own when the historical reality is that humanism has Christian roots. Historic Christian humanism was championed by Catholics like Erasmus and St. Thomas. Thomas More as an alternative to what they felt were, were the limitations of medieval scholasticism. Stephen, I know you can be found at decentfilms.com. You recently redesigned your site. Yes, we have a brand new decentfilms.com for the first time in 10 years. The site is a huge improvement on what was there before. One great thing about it is that it's now mobile friendly, so you can read it on your smartphone or tablet. All right, you can find Stephen at decentfilms.com and his reviews in the National Catholic Register. Stephen Gradonis, thanks. Thank you, Brian. And for the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick, and we leave you tonight with snapshots of Pope Francis' wonderful, joyful interactions with the faithful today and this week. Good night and God bless you.